ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in to Red Ice Radio. I'm Henrik. The website is redice.tv. It's always a pleasure to have you with us on the show. Today, we're going to speak with Dr. Kevin McDonald and also Dr. Andrew Joyce. We're going to talk a bit about Trump's recent ban. Uh, we're going to talk, of course, more about some of the developments that has occurred here in the last couple of weeks since he's been uh, inaugurated and, and, of course, some of the violence that we've seen. But let me just briefly tell you about uh, Dr. Kevin McDonald. If you don't know his work, he has a PhD in behavioral sciences and is an expert on Jewish influence and identity. He is also, of course, the editor-in-chief and contributor of The Occidental Observer, which is an online publication that focuses on white identity, white interests, and the culture of the West in uh, general. Thank you for coming on, Kevin. It's good to have you with us. It's great to be here again, Henry. I always enjoy it. Excellent. And then we have Dr. Uh, Andrew Joyce as well. He's a scholar, a speaker, and a writer with uh, academic expertise on immigration, ethnic and religious conflict and philosophy. Andrew sits on the editorial advisory board of the Occidental Quarterly and is also a regular contributor to the Occidental Observer. Thank you for coming on, Andrew. It's good to uh, have you back again. It's a pleasure, Henrik. It's a real pleasure to be back. Well, gentlemen, let's just kind of dive into this a uh, little bit uh, with an overview first of what we've seen in the last couple of weeks here with, with Trump. I, th I think things have actually been changing drastically fast and we've seen even some of the pundits and commentators and media commenting on this fact that they're up in arms about the fact that trump is actually the one politician the non-politician i guess to a certain extent that actually has fulfilled many of his promises we're so used to politicians talking and talking and talking and then once they get into office nothing actually happens trump has actually done already a lot of the things that he said he was going to do he's issued of course a uh, number of executive orders and everything else. Um, so this has been just fascinating to watch. And I think the reactions have been just uh, kind of hilarious and, and uh, way over the top from the from the left as well. We'll get into that more detail later. But uh, Kevin, let, let's go over to you first. What do you think about Trump's first two weeks in office? Things are changing pretty fast, aren't they? They're changing extremely fast. And, and uh, uh, there's been a, a real hysteria on the left um, they, uh, they, you still can't uh, adjust the fact that they lost this election. Uh, they've tried to, uh, first they, they did the, the voting recount thing. They tried the Russian hacking. They're, they're definitely trying to, uh, delegitimize, to, to, to make him seem, uh, a, a, you know, illegitimate president. Um, and now, you know, since he's gotten in office, he has, as you say, he has, fulfilled and stated he's going to fulfill some of his promises. He's talked about building the wall. He, he uh, announced this travel ban from certain Muslim countries. Well, when you announce a travel ban, that means you're, you're categorizing certain people as not acceptable for entry to the United States. That is absolutely opposed to the whole multicultural mantra. It's the whole uh, um, idea that everybody's the same and that America should welcome everyone from everywhere. So this has gotten huge pushback. Uh, and uh, again, we, we've had protests really since the election. Uh, and, and, and there's one thing after another, but the most recent thing definitely at all these big airports has been, uh, has to do with the Muslim ban. Um, and but I, I, yeah, I, I don't see this as uh, really hurting Trump. My, my understanding is that the polls are very much supporting what he's done. Uh, and uh, he's, he said he's doing exactly what he said he was going to do. And um, I think we should be very hard into that because I, I know a lot of us on the all right were concerned that he really wouldn't follow through on a lot of this, that he yeah. you know, that this was a little bit, uh, you know, bait and switch kind of thing. But I think that I think the people behind Trump, uh, Steve Bannon in particular, uh, are very serious about this. I think they want a revolution in this country. And I think they want a revolution. And so the left is, is going to just go apoplectic about every little step of the way here. But we'll see. I, I think that, that Trump is going to retain substantial support for what he's doing. Andrew, what do you think uh, for the first couple of weeks here? Well, I've been very pleasantly surprised. Um, my surprise is rooted in much the same place that the left surprise uh, was. And that is that I think all of us at the back of our minds uh, either, either feared or hoped, depending on what perspective you're coming from, but that Trump might not fulfill many of the electoral uh, race pledges that he made, in particular relating to the wall. I mean, I remember countless media articles emerging 
especially in the, the few weeks before Trump took office, uh, saying, oh, he's backtracking on the wall. And there was kind of lots of this media narrative uh, pushing the idea that his voters had been duped. But as the days go on, and these executive orders have emerged. I think the surprise and the, and the shock, certainly pleasant surprise for me, has really come to the fore. And he does seem to be determined, and those people in his cabinet also seem determined to push through what is, as Kevin suggests, there might be a revolutionary uh, legislative change uh, in the United States. I mean, just two hours ago, uh, the news broke that tr the latest um, policy move to emerge from the Trump administration is that this um, counter-extremism or count countering violent extremism program run by the government is no longer going to look into this, this uh, white supremacist extremism or right-wing extremism uh, thing, which was only ever in large part a myth anyway. But that's going to completely just go out the window and it's going to be renamed countering Islamic extremism or countering radical Islamic extremism. So mm. that, that's, that's a big, big deal because groups uh, that oppose our set of ideas have been really pushing the meme of right-wing extremism, which is a myth, for decades. And this has been a huge project of theirs. And, you know, overnight... Trump could be upending it, and I can only just say I'm thrilled. You know, as each day uh, comes and goes, it's just it brings another little surprise, and I'm I'm ex I have to say I'm excited and I'm optimistic. Um, and what it is going to do, as Kevin suggested, there is the left are just going to become apoplectic because the let's not forget that they want to shift that Overton window as well, and. One of the reasons why they've been so erratic and so violent recently is because they were really pushing hard and pulling hard in the direction of an open borders position on immigration. And it's it's not moved a, a huge amount away from where it was, but it's, it's significant enough when the open borders is what you're pushing for. So heightened security, heightened vetting, the banning of certain groups even temporarily runs so much against the kind of philosophy that they're cherishing. Yeah, it seems to me too that just a tiny bit of opposition and, and these people are out on the street and protesting and, and it shows how unaccustomed they are to actually uh, not to get their way. And as soon as they don't get their way, they are protesting and they protest violently. Uh, they target people violently who are Trump supporters. Uh, as we saw, of course, in that Portland airport, there, there was, I don't know, hundreds of people maybe following this one guy into the airport. Uh, eventually knocking him on his feet. Uh, and, and this is what I think we're going to see more of, gentlemen, as as this kind of heat is turned up and, and as things are actually beginning to move in a counter uh, opposition here so or in a different direction. So what do you guys more specifically think that some of the reactions to this are going to, to become? I think there was an, an issue here now during the inauguration that those people that had been uh, violently, uh, you know, demonstrating and destroying property and things like that, that they were potentially looking at, was it up to 10 years in prison, that there was another kind of set of rules here that might be put in place to try to deter these people from from acting in these violent kind of behaviors. Uh, do you think, guys, that that's going to go through? And do you think that this will deter the left and these so-called anti-fascists? Or is this going to be ramping up and continuing now? Well, what was... Striking to me last night about what happened in Berkeley was that the, the, my understanding is that, is that there were no arrests. The police just stood around and watched these guys destroy a property. Uh, there were some physical assaults and so on. Uh, but the Trump administration is talking about withholding funds from UC Berkeley. Now that will get their attention. My understanding is they get about a half of a billion dollars a year in research funds through the federal government. And every, every public university in the country. And every private university really depends on government money these days. There's a huge, huge pipeline there. So they have some ability to, they, they could maybe cut some of this money off. And believe me, universities pay attention to money. So I do think that there's some things they can do. Uh, but uh, when you, like, with the, there's a tweet from the mayor of Berkeley, and he seemed to approve of the protests. So, you know, you, you've got a long ways to go. You've got these sanctuary city mayors. 
uh, Trump has declared war on sanctuary cities. And one of the things he's going to do is prevent them from getting their, from, you know, he's going to cut off money from them. Uh, and and uh, so it's very important. Uh, I think they do have some, some, uh, you know, some, some things they can do, even if the local police don't uh, do anything. Uh, we, you know, I think money talks to, to, to cities, to states, and to universities. And Trump uh, has already signaled that he's willing to go there. I hope he does. Yeah. And for those who don't know, then the UC Berkeley issue uh, is, of course, we had those speech by Milo there. Um, they did manage to shut it down on the day of the inauguration. That was in uh, Seattle. Uh, I believe there's one person that was shot and supposedly the one person who did shoot the other said, well, I, I did it because I believed he was a racist. And apparently there was no charge after that point. I've actually haven't followed up to confirm uh, that that actually is the is the end result of that altercation or that shooting, I should say. Um, but uh, Kevin, what's so ironic here is, of course, that it's the, the, where where this was shut out, shut down last night. The UC Berkeley campus. That's the same campus where the free speech movement began. Isn't that ironic? Right. And yet, <laughs> and yet, there was this article in Newsweek where the journalist was saying that that what happened last night is in the grand tradition of the free speech movement. Talk <laughs> right. about ironic. Uh, you know, I mean, they 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 just don't. Uh, it just doesn't register. I mean, the idea that there that there's no free speech for fascists, as they say is a very common thing now that you you can do anything to these people you can shut them down you can physically attack them you can do anything to uh anything's okay but i do think that trump is not going to put up with this and and uh, he will find ways to clamp down on universities uh, cities that that defy his immigration policies and, and so on um, but uh, there are things he can do he's in a very powerful position right now yeah, definitely. I, I think this is uh, very encouraging. Things are, are changing drastically. How is this going to we can get into more details of this later uh, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the uh, the protests that we've seen and everything else. But Andrew, how do you think that this is going to affect uh, European politics in terms of um, Europe fe feeling emboldened to to go this direction and to maybe even see that if America dares to do something like this, many European nations could get an idea of like, hey, you know what? Why don't why don't we do something similar like that? Why don't we put politicians in place that actually also want to stop immigration in this way, or or make sure that the people that are coming into our country to begin on a on a first level on this aren't like extreme radical terrorists? Can't we have a vetting process too? Right? Isn't that going to embolden uh, Europeans? Yeah, I think a lot of this will depend on to what extent Europeans, the silent majority of Europeans decide to assert themselves at the polls and also to some extent they're going to speak up in the media and develop a more visible presence and I'm, I'm not really discussing f the French situation here because the Front National have been quite good in this respect but I think that one of the problems you see in the United States is that the left are very good and Kevin mentioned it earlier at making lots of noise and this, this ability that they have to make a lot of noise, often at very short notice, and with their agents in the media and academia and elsewhere, it can create an atmosphere and thus a perception that they are in control, that they yeah. are the dominant majority. And actually, this is not the case. We saw with the Brexit vote and with the Trump vote that... The, the, you know, the majority of people are coming around to a very common sense view of immigration, the nature of Islamic terrorism, and the direction that their nations were heading in. And I think it's about time that people in the United States, it's, it's certainly moving in that direction now, but certainly in Europe, need to become better at making noise, at making their voices heard. Uh, that can be done to some extent via elections and polls and referenda, but it, it may develop to the point where we really need to start taking to the streets in large numbers and confronting many of these noisemakers whose ideology is extremely shallow, very dangerous, and a threat to our way of life. And I, I, I am optimistic. I don't want to deliver a black pill on any of this. I am optimistic. I think that 
a breaking point will arrive. I think that the election of Donald Trump and the example that he will set will be a great boon to nationalists and normal, well-meaning people and families across Europe. And I, I just think that, that there's a tremendous opportunity here. And I hope that we see uh, that example really catch on and that it, it starts the fire. Yeah. The, the issue here, too, I want to just bring up is we are looking, obviously, at an aging majority also. It, it seems that this window uh, that we thankfully are getting help from now, finally, from from our own people who are, who are older, if you will, the older generations, uh, is, is what's tipping the scales. But let's just be honest about this, that if this uh, would something like this be able to occur if we were in, let's say, 20, 20 years from now, uh, 30 years, depends on what country you're talking about. But, you know, America, uh, the, the left has, has gained so much because they have most of the younger, younger generations are uh, now are becoming, you know, they're non-white, they're non-European, and they're going to increasingly go to the left and turn to, to the left side of things. So that's a, a big worry, guys, that, that you know, if we, we, we don't have this window of opportunity forever, we have to strike now. Are you, are you saying, though, Andrew, that you wish to see more people taking action to kind of be visible out there, to like show themselves and show their discontent uh, in the way that the left has? Yes, I am. And I share and always have shared your opinion that this is a very narrow window of opportunity that we have and that you know the hourglass is rapidly running out of sand we don't have a, a huge amount of time here um, the balance of political opinion is linked to demographics and unfortunately because of the control that our opponents have had of the media the popular mass media academia uh, it, almost every part of our culture is saturated with leftist propaganda, open, which is quite open in espousing open borders ideology, uh, and in particular also the, the white guilt meme also, so that most of our young people, um, I, I don't think it's an overwhelming majority, but I would still say it's the majority of young people, do carry a certain element of self-hate and will be very difficult to convert to our way of thinking. Um, so, yes, time is running out now. What, what does that mean that the rest of us have to do? Well, I think if we have any hope of trying to convert lots of the young people, then we need to have young, active movements that will have to take to the street, um, set an example peacefully. Um, but we, we are going to need to become more visible. We will need to confront the people that are trying to shut down our right to, to free speech and assert ourselves over them uh, with with force if necessary but peacefully by choice yeah kevin do you do you think with all the recent violence that we've seen uh that this um i don't know how what to call it but does it does it benefit our point of view that when people i mean i saw the tremendous amounts of comments of course when, when richard what was sucker punched out on the streets in dc there was all, all kinds of filth and, and media pundits and even celebrities coming out of the woodwork. So like, oh, great, you can always, you know, I don't believe in violence, but you can always like beat up a neo-Nazi. That's great, you know, uh, lots of thumbs up for that. But I wonder if that is what's going to gain them traction at the end of the day. I think that there, it looks like there's more and more support for people who actually, to a certain extent, take the blows. I don't know if you agree with that or not, Kevin, it, but it looks like to me that the more they show their true colors, which is violence and, and intolerance uh, to a certain extent. I think a lot of people are opening their eyes to, to who these people really are, don't you think? I should think so. Um, and I, I certainly agree with Andrew that, that you know, and, and you that this is demographic time bomb that has to be reversed. I was very encouraged that there was a, a sort of leak from the Trump administration that immigrants, uh, you know, whether they were legal or not, could be deported if they were on welfare. Now, this would just absolutely make the left go crazy. This is an attempt to roll back some of the immigration, some of the legal immigration, and that would be very heartening. Uh, the, the other point I make is that um, I, I think young people, I, actually, for the, the, the demographic 18 to 29 white people did vote for Donald Trump. Uh, and I think as they get older, they will be even more inclined to do so. 
So I, I don't think it's set in stone that if you watched MTV and went to a university when you were 20, that you're going to have these points of view when you're 35 and you're married and you're living in the suburbs and you start seeing the real problems and how the real world works. So I think, uh, but yeah, that does not get rid of the fact uh, that I think more children are born in this country now who are non-white than are white. So we have to do something to reverse this demographic trend. We can't just get rid of illegal aliens or something and think the problem is solved. Yeah. I, th I think a lot of the problem that, uh, that that what's happened with the left is extreme frustration. I think they felt that they were just on the verge of complete victory. If Hillary had won, uh, you would have had uh, within the next four years, you'd have had about probably eight million more non-whites in the country. Eight years, twice that. Uh, they would have they would have revamped. They would have passed an immigration law, if, especially if there's a Democrat majority, which they were anticipating uh, for a while anyway. Um, they, they would have appointed Supreme Court justices who were entirely on board with that. They would have restricted gun rights and the whole thing. They were on, on the verge of a complete permanent revolution. Uh, and then what happened, that Trump came along and completely dislodged that. And, and he's introducing these policies that are absolutely going against this whole thing, including the, his, most re his, his recent Supreme Court point, uh, pick. Uh, so this is this is just uh, cataclysmic for the left. You know, you can imagine, it, it, as I say, it's frustration when you're on the verge of victory, and then all of a sudden uh, you, you have this Trump phenomenon. Very, very uh, frustrating. And as every psychologist will tell you, frustration leads to aggression. They are very, very angry right now. Yeah, but they've been getting their way and and winning and winning and winning winning right and 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 just one right. little. I mean, I'm not saying that this is a slight sidestep. I mean, it isn't, frankly. I mean, it's a yeah. it's a huge thing, and 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 uh, as you say, a lot of things are rolling back now. But but shouldn't they be like, you know, okay, well, that, that's fine. You know, we have been advancing for no. That that's not how they think, is it? It's just they they're in this thing to win, right? They're they're in this thing to conquer right. us. And they've got this view that history is going one way and they're on the right side and it's just going to keep going this way. Yeah. You know, transgender bathrooms and open borders and, you know, all kinds of the, the whole program uh, was just about to be completely uh, ensconced. And then they would have a, this, this majority that would be really unseatable uh, if she had gotten in. And here we are now in a situation where these policies are being rolled back and where history may not be entirely one direction. Uh, and and we may, we're seeing a real rollback here and a real pushback. So uh, we have to expect that they'll be angry and, and that they'll protest and go crazy for the next four years. But I, I think that uh, so that Trump, that, you know, there is a sign of majority, as Andrew's saying. And I think that, that people... Uh, when they see all these protests, when they see free speech being shut down, people being assaulted for supporting Trump, well, that that support that that strengthens Trump uh, in the long run, I think. Yeah, I mean, this increasing polarization is not going to end anytime soon. We've seen this in other countries in the past in history. You have, uh, I mean, basically, what it turns into is like. Uh, communists against against fascists to a certain extent. I mean, that's the, these are the polarized sides that have been popping up through history. They've been called different things, but they're more or less been kind of the same reflections of it. Uh, and, and the thing is that at some point you have to take a, I guess you have to take a side. I mean, history doesn't care whether you're like, well, I'm not a, you know, we can have someone who's like slightly maybe on the right or slightly conservative or something like, well, I'm not a, I'm not a racist, but it's like to the left, it doesn't matter. They consider you a neo-Nazi if you're not like with Bernie Sanders or, you know, if you're slightly to the right of that, you're you're a neo-Nazi and that's it. And they'll violently oppose you. So, so do you guys think that these people who are slightly, you know, the cucks and the, you know, mellow conservatives and things, are they actually going to come out and take a side in this thing? Are they going to side with us or with them? They will be forced to. They will, they will be forced to, to, the, to the, I hate to say that we're on the fringes, but they will be pushed closer to us. And further away, further to the right of the position that they think that they are currently on, purely because of the, the violence and aggression that will be directed against them by the left, by the militant left, which is, which is, which is now rapidly developing. They won't have a choice. Um, yeah. 
you, you hear about these alt light figures and they want to disavow with the Jewish question or you know, there's, they are, they are literally Hitler to these people. Yeah. Um, Trump is literally Hitler to these people. <laughs> Someone who's wearing one of the red make America great again hats is literally Hitler to these people. We will all find ourselves bad fellows, whether we like it or not. Uh, whether someone who's really hard line on the, the JQ and doesn't really like uh, Mike Cernovich, for example, or uh, Paul Joseph Watson, we will all find ourselves bad fellows at some point because politics is becoming polarized. And uh, as you said, Henrik, you know, we may find ourselves in a situation where the, the, the political context becomes so extreme that there is very little to divide between communists and fascists. It, it may just come down to, to such extremes if the political context deteriorates to such an extent. But I, I think as time goes on, I mean, lots of these assaults that have been happening, yes, the assault on Richard Spencer was egregious and despicable and everything else, but as I wrote in a recent article, I think the bigger story that is emerging is of these assaults on Kind of average guys wearing Donald Trump supporting caps and they are being hunted down in the streets. They're being assaulted and beaten unconscious. It, it, like Kevin mentioned earlier, I'm also very, very surprised at the lack of arrests that have been happening. Mm -hmm. The police response has been kind of disappointing to this violence <clears throat> thus far, even in those cases where the violence at the inauguration uh, was ongoing and we saw some arrests and yes, some of these people may face up to 10 years in prison. I won't hold my breath to see if that happens. But, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I, just in trying to wrap my own head around why the police response has been so lackadaisical, I think we have to look at the fact that BLM, Black Lives Matter, has almost neutered the police force with, with its politically correct rhetoric. And it, it's kind of got the police in this self-conscious state where to pull a weapon or to exert authority on criminals becomes a highly dubious act and one that should be kind of should we pass this before our you know political correctness officer first before we <laughs> respond in this way you know it, 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 there are seeds of doubt and everything has to go through a second thought process there's no room for just an authoritative response but also the media has done a diabolically excellent job of shaping the narrative of who is entitled to victim status. And what that results in is that Richard Spencer can be assaulted with a cheap shot in broad daylight with a guy's forearm going right into his face. And even though Richard Spencer has never committed a crime in his life, he will have no entitlement to a victim status in that scenario. Right. In fact, the guy that assaults him in that manner will be construed through media manipulation to have been the victim or to be defending victims. So there are, you know, in terms of uh, quote-unquote Nazis or alt-right figures having any room at all within media coverage to be portrayed as victims of anti-fa violence, whatever, there is no room at the end for us. Um, we are out on a limb. We are in no man's land. And if it comes down to issues of defense protection, or we will have to look into providing those for ourselves. The police have been neutered. The media is not on our side. We cannot rely on them to convey a narrative that is truthful to the silent majority. So we will have to get our own truth out there and we will have to protect ourselves. One of the things I like to see, of course, was that Trump seems to have emboldened the police officers. He, he's come out in uh, in in very staunch support uh, of uh, you know the Blue Lives Matter movement as as a contrast to the B, to BLM and I think as you say Andrew I definitely agree with that the media has done a, an excellent job at uh, focusing and singling out several police officers uh, in in a way with such wall to wall coverage that I think individual police officers out there operating in the real world before they think about things, they see themselves like maybe plastered on the media as being the next one of these, uh, you know, guilty, uh, guilty ones. And, and again, of course, there's there's bad cops, there's things that happen. But, you know, on, on, on average, I think that this has been done completely to demoralize the police departments to make sure that basically any kind of 
uh, violence, any kind of protests g will will be allowed to it. Um, because I don't see this as organic at all. I don't know about many of these protests, but they seem highly organized. We saw, I forget which city it was now, but we saw, I think it was before the election, uh, rows and rows of buses. I think it might have been in Chicago, but I might be wrong there. Someone actually filmed it and, and put it up on, on uh, Periscope. Someone has been sending in people to these cities in, in droves, and someone have been funding the, you know, these people to come in. And, and it's, I see this as a complete manipulation of, uh, of, of um, you know, the narrative of basically trying to induce that this is where the majority is. This is where the majority of population uh, lie when it comes to their political views, etc. But I don't think I don't think this is the case uh, at all. What do you guys think? I think there's I've read some things that, that George Soros has actually funded some of these Black Lives Matter groups and you know, funded people who go to these protests. But the amazing thing, I mean, this, this is a, a, people who are victims of their own ideology. These Black Lives Matter, uh, what, what they're doing is making black communities very much unsafer than they used to be. Uh, and, and it's because the police are very hesitant. I mean, so you've seen big increases in, in murder and shootings in places like Chicago, Baltimore, uh, and so on, where you have big black inner city populations. Um, they, you know, they got this ideology that the whole problem really is policing. Well, the whole problem is you got some very bad guys uh, on the streets and they're killing each other and they're making the whole place unsafe for anybody. And of course, businesses are, are pulling out or they're already pulled out. And uh, so you've got a completely dysfunctional community and you're going to end up uh, with, uh, you know, battle zones like Detroit, where, where you just have a lot of empty storefronts and people moved out and housing value is going down to nothing. And uh, people, you know, pillaging the houses for plumbing and things like that. Um, I mean, that, that's the reality of inner cities in America now. And, and so these people, you know, claim to want to, you know, advance black rights. But what they're doing is destroying these communities. Black communities need strong policing. It's for their own good. Uh, and I agree, sometimes cops are out of control. I, I worry every time uh, I, if, if I think I'm going to get stopped or something like that, especially down in, uh, when I was in California, in Orange County. I mean, the cops really did uh, shoot first and ask questions later. And mm -hmm. I don't think it had anything to do with race. Uh, you know, a lot of cops really are irresponsible. But uh, black areas need strong policing, and they're not getting it now. Heather McDonald, uh, you know, has the all the numbers on this, and it's very, very uh, persuasive that Black Lives Matter has done nothing except just you know unleash this this uh, wave of violence in the black inner cities. Yeah, I mean, the left wants this violence, though. They they thrive on destabilization and disruption. They they thrive on basically causing chaos and then and then in that chaos they can reform things as they see fit that's why i see uh this as another attempt at, at basically you know gaining uh political stance and 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 move ahead but I, I don't think most people they don't they don't want any of this i mean i i saw you know you see these white people out with signs and young white women standing there and like completely devoid of any kind of ethnic awareness of their own group or how they're being pushed out and they're standing there with signs and support of black lives matter and what the police are doing and everything else w what is going to turn these women around i mean are they are they a lost cause or are these women just basically we can't we can't do anything about them uh, the the worse it gets on some level uh, maybe if they have children on their own one day they would want to live in a society that is that's peaceful and has some order in it <laughs> what it's going to take guys to to get these people to realize what what this is about you know from a psychology psychological point of view this is something i've been interested in i mean th there's a big sex difference in personality when it comes to uh, in, uh what we call nurturance affection and family relationships and so on so when 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 women see the the, the syrian child washing up on the beach in turkey they get all empathic and so the, what, what the media does is exploit this. They, they have all these sob stories. And we've already seen that. You know, the, if you look at the LA Times, the Washington Post, New York Times, they're full of stories now about people who have been inconvenienced by Trump, Trump's travel ban. You know, as if one person's situation should dictate a policy, you know, that is, is in general, you know, and, and very much uh, tuned to, to the protection of Americans and so on. 
Um, but but that's what they do, and 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 they're very effective at that. And, and women, far more than men, uh, are susceptible to those kinds of arguments. They they're they're basically nice people. And so when you have a, a like an earthquake in Haiti or something like that, you have all these women offering to take in Haitian orphans and so on. Um, and the, the the other thing I, I noticed was that the, the women are far more likely to to uh, you know to reject family members or other contacts on social media and so on if they are conservative. So you have these these Democrat women, liberal women, or you know, or you know, far left women, very very much prone to you know getting rid of, of people that they disagree with, and and I and I and that's much more than men. About five to one, actually, in, in terms of, uh, of of being willing to do that. So they're very willing to shut down free speech. They don't want to hear alternative points of view, and the reason I think is because they have fallen for the idea that th that this is really a moral argument. This is not an intellectual argument. That it's a moral argument that people who voted for Trump, who are all right or anything over in that part of the political spectrum, are not just misguided. They they don't have ideas that uh, we could teach them about or something. It, it, it's, they are evil and they are doing things, things maliciously and intentionally. They're filled with hatred, they're filled with anger, uh, they're filled with fear, and uh, it's all about morality. Uh, whereas people on the right do not think of people on the left as immoral. We think of them as misguided, as overly idealistic, as naive. Uh, as unaware of what the long-term consequences are going to be, or as ignoring the effects on women and rape and so on in Europe. Um, but we don't think of them as evil. And, and that's the thing, is that they think of us as, as evil. And end of story. And when, you, when the person is evil, what do you do? You don't talk to them. You can do anything to them. They're, they're an outlaw. You can beat them up. You can exclude them from your uh, circle of friends. Uh, you, really, anything is is okay. So I think that's that's a big part of the problem. Women, way more than men, willing to do that. Well, you know, after this travel ban, which they call a Muslim ban, which which of course it isn't, I saw arguments that literally this is killing people. People were recycling yeah. that image of Alan Kurdi on the beach there in, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, in the Mediterranean Sea. They tried to cross that. But what about that little girl who was killed in in Nice in that tri the the attack? Uh, exactly. I mean, we we have that image of like her lying under a blanket with her doll next to her, and I I I couldn't even find her name. I tried I I searched you know several news sites and and tried to find what was her name. No, everyone knows who Alan Curdy is. This is how you know solidly the media has branded this image in our heads. But no one thinks about that little little girl that was killed. Why is that? I mean, it's it's equally uh, from their perspective. Shouldn't this be an equal equal value kind of situation? <laughs> Except that the media is uh, obviously taking sides here, and, and they, you know, that is an iconic photo uh, the, the, of what occurred in Nice with that little girl and the doll sitting on the street. I mean, it, it tears at your hearts, but. Uh, you know, that's not going to be something that the media is going to stress. I mean, they, they want to portray to me this violence as a work of a very small number of people. It's manageable. We can get through it. It's not going to be a, a long-term problem. These people are just wonderful. I know so they'll always talk about the success stories. They'll talk about the guy who, you know, went to school and got a college degree. <laughs> yeah, the brain you know, surgeon. That's what they always do, and they do with Mexican immigrants. Uh, the LA Times is just replete over the years. You can go back 20, 30 years. They, they've always had articles uh, about uh, striving immigrants, you know, who are illegal and they're oppressed because of that. And, you know, so that, that's their point of view and, and they're very effective. And, and it really works with a lot of people, especially women. Uh, they, they, they think of anybody who opposes that as, again, not just misguided, but evil. They, they can, you can just do anything you want to them. If I could just add something to what Kevin said there about the photograph of the little girl with the doll lying beside her, I think we could come back again to this issue of the media framing and dictating who is allowed to have victim status. Right. And the fact is that whites are not allowed to feel sorry for themselves or to mourn the loss of their own. We aren't permitted to mourn that little girl just as we aren't permitted to mourn 
or acknowledge the victims of black violence in South Africa or other victims of non-white violence in the United States or wherever they may be in the world because the media really insidiously implants in us the notion that if we mourn our own explicitly, then that is racist and that and that is evil. So that image of that little girl, we aren't allowed to dwell and reflect on that and take it to heart and, God forbid, take action based on it because we are, we are simply not allowed to mourn her. We aren't right. allowed to acknowledge her loss. It's one thing if you were her parent that you'd be allowed to mourn for her or something like that. But you can't mourn for her as a member of the, a white European majority uh, who's been victimized. That, that you just don't do. Yeah, it's like we can't operate again on a, on a collective level. It, it, it's always another group who happens to be non-European. They are always acting in a very, very collectivized way. They're very, they always support each other most of the time anyway. They always rally around each other, in some cases even across groups. The, the whole, the whole non-white spectrum goes together as a solid group to operate against white people. And then we on top of that have a, a tendency to see individualization as the highest moral value that while we don't see color we just we're everyone is an is an individual i mean we right. can't we can't operate in that in that framework let's face it i mean a group is always going to be more powerful than the individual and then you have you know people from our perspective they're kind of slightly on our page they're pro-western in their values and they don't like maybe islam and stuff like that but they just they can't operate on a collectivized level because somehow we've been taught to believe to a certain extent that that's that's a that's something beneath you. It's not really a, a, a good thing to do. And also on top of it, you have this issue that, oh, then it leads to dangerous things such as Nazism or Bolshevism, right? So we can't be collectivized. That's very true. I think that's, that's a fundamental point that we tend to be individualists and the media likes it that way. We're not supposed to have a collective identity of any kind. I know in my own case, it was hard for me. I, I know back, this is quite a while ago, you know, I, I used to think about, you know, having identity as a white person and and you know even thinking about myself as an in ethnic terms very hard to do you know it was just sort of not on on the radar screen it's not something i was brought up with not something that anybody ever you know um, wanted me to do or never got it in school or certainly the media doesn't push it so yeah i mean that 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 was the reality that, that we are expected to be uh, individualists and any collective sense of, of identity is anathema. And that's, that's what the, what the, what the all right is really shaking the cage on. You know, we are talking about identity and that is, uh, that is the third rail of politics that white people should not have identity. And, and you know, the, the, with, on the, with the left, on the other hand, they've been pushing identity for all these other groups and they shouldn't be surprised as whites start to see this happening, that they form an identity. I think a lot of it is what I call implicit identity. They don't explicitly say to themselves, but they're thinking that way. And I think a lot of Trump votes came from people who are thinking in terms of white identity at an implicit level. Uh, it's interesting in a lot of the counties in, in the Midwest, in Iowa and Wisconsin and so on, that are seeing the biggest changes are the ones that voted for Trump. They're, they're seeing an influx of immigrants that they've never seen before. You know, the immigrants are gradually spreading around the whole country. They used to be always concentrated completely in the big cities. Well, you know, that, that's going to end and, and, and there's not going to be any place in, in America that doesn't have them. I, I'm just in the radio where I live in a small town now and you have this, you know, shooting uh, with a gang connected guy with a very Latino name uh, and is involved with drugs and here he is up in the middle of nowhere. You know, and th th that's that's the reality now in America. And so white people are, are getting it, even the ones in the rural areas. And uh, we were seeing that we, we can't just keep this uh, at bay forever. I wanted to talk a bit about the, this travel ban. It's for 90 days. It's from seven countries, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Sudan, Libya, Yemen and Somalia. I think there's someone mentioned there's about I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people or maybe maybe it was just over 100,000 or so that fly into the United States every day, travel, you know, in some way. I don't think it was like around 100 people or so that was kind of squeezed in between this decision when it was made, uh, which is, you know, OK, sorry for them. That's that's difficult. And you have to fly back and that kind of stuff. But it's like 
it's not like anyone has been murdered here, but that's almost like the left, how they've been reacting to this. That it's, I mean, this is the epitome of a fascist dictatorship when you can't move, despite the fact that we have, in many of these countries, uh, we have tremendous problems with uh, ISIS supporters and terrorism coming out of these countries. We don't know, as Trump had been saying, who these people are. We have to vet them before they come in. This is lo logically the, the the most sane position to take. And as, as far as I understand it, this 90-day travel ban is basically to like halt the process until the administration can figure out what the hell is going on and how are they going to deal with this. What do you guys think is going to come out of this at the end of the day? Are things going to open up again and they have some vetting system in place or any any thoughts here of what they're actually going to do and what's going to happen after this point? I think it's a starting point. I think that in some respects, the Trump administration is dipping its toe in the water. This, I think, to some extent is going to be a test exercise to see what can be put through at short notice, uh, what international reactions are like, and what potentialities are for the future. This is not an extreme measure, as you said, Henrik. This is a reasonable, uh, well considered, perhaps not the most efficiently implemented measure that could have been uh, carried out, but it, it's an eminently sensible legislative move. It's provoked an absolutely hysterical and very noisy reaction. I don't think, though, that it will give serious pause for thought to the likes of Steve Bannon and others in the, in the, the Trump administration. I think that they will push forward. Because immigration uh, of, of all stripes, I think, is a concern to those in this administration. <clears throat> and I think that in time, and let's not, I think, I still believe that Trump's election victory came as a surprise even to Trump and those close to him. Yeah. So I think that when we give them a little bit of time to gather their thoughts and gather their resources, uh, muster their strength and really produce a focused piece of legislation, I think we will be surprised again. And I think that uh, a serious assault or rollback on this slide towards open borders that we've been seeing will take place. And I think that we may just be seeing the start of something here. Mm. Perhaps that's me being overly optimistic, but yeah. I think this is just the beginning. Uh, I, I noticed today that uh, someone who has uh, been appointed a senior advisor of Trump's name, Michael Alden, wrote an article before the election under a pseudonym. But the, the article argued basically that, that, that the Republican Party had to do something about the demographics because the, the conservatives were basically flying off a cliff. They're, and if Hillary had gotten in, they, they would never want another election. And uh, But I think the, the idea is that, that that these people are never going to vote in a conservative kind of way. They, they do not want limited government. They want you know, more and more of their people. They want you know, entitlements and handouts and all the things the federal government can give them. And uh, there's simply no way that any kind of limited government conservative can survive in that kind of environment. So the only, and the only solution is demographic. They understand that it's gone beyond the point now where you can just you know, shut off, uh, you can, you know, deport illegals and think you've solved the problem. You have to start thinking about how you can cut back on, on legal immigration and start deporting people, ending birthright citizenship, maybe deporting all the immigrants who have received welfare, uh, refugees uh, as not really having a, a claim on citizenship. I mean, they can, they can start doing this. And I think they're motivated to do that. Because if they don't, they are going to lose for certain. And that was the yeah. message of, 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 of the, this Michael Alton article. You're going to lose for sure. So you might as well go down fighting, you know, and, 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 and that way you at least say, well, I fought the good fight. And, and uh, I think that's the way they, they, they may see it over there. Now, Trump is obviously, he's resisting the, the globalist plans here. He's, he's hitting back hard. And I'm going to talk more about this after the break. What, what, what really this is about when it comes to some of the other people that is around Trump. Obviously, there are some, uh, you know, Jewish people in, around Trump, and some some people have 
uh, you know, voiced concern about Trump on this issue. They said, for example, this issue the other day that he uh, didn't include Jews specifically in the in the Holocaust remembrance, and there was an uproar about this. Uh, so I want to ask you guys where he is on this page, and, and where some of the other people, some of the influencing influencers around Trump, wh- where they are on this page. I mean, are they seeking to maybe restore the USA to a certain extent? They realize that if the, if the demographic issue just completely gets out of control. America is not going to be that superpower anymore. Maybe, maybe they won't even be in a position to pre- protect Israel. Is is that part of the equation? So we're going to get into that a little bit more uh, later. Also, this issue of Trump killing, of course, the P- uh, TPP, and now he's he's want to renegotiate NAFTA. So there's a lot of good things here happening that the left should be encouraged by as well. So we'll get into that. But uh, before we take a, a break here, gentlemen, tell us what you got going on right now. If there's something upcoming you have, and, and tell us about the. Uh, the material that you have out there. Let's begin with you, Kevin. Tell us about your book and tell us what's going on on the site right now. Well, I am trying to write a book uh, gradually. I, I just uh, I published an article in Axel Quarterly on the Indo-Europeans, a previous one on the role of church in American history. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of carrying through on that, uh, but slowly, because I got a lot of other things I have to do. The actual observer is going strong. Uh, we should have an article today about the situation in Germany where that politician, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but uh, spelled H-O with an umlaut, uh, C-K-E, uh, uh, the uh, alternative for Deutschland uh, talked about uh, ending the Holocaust guilt mentality. Yes. And that that is, uh, you know, a hugely important thing for Germany to do. Unfortunately, I don't think his statements were well received. I think the AFD has actually lost some support from a poll I saw, but I don't know. I, you know, it, it, I, I do worry about Europe uh, a lot, and and I think that Germany is the most cut country uh, around, and and we have to hope that they can come to their senses. But uh, my understanding is that the left is gaining there, so the, we're we're trying to post things on on Europe uh, quite quite a bit now. Very good. The Occidental Observer also, of course, check out the Culture of Critique. We'll have links up, ladies and gentlemen. Do check out uh, Kevin's work if you're not familiar with that. It has red pilled a tremendous amount of people on the on the jq and he brings of course an academic view to this a very reasonable this is not out of the left field something weird or hateful or strange or anything like that this is very highly reasonable scientific kind of stuff so you need to read the culture of critique to understand why kevin is talking about these things so often and how that plays into uh, white identity and white interests uh, so definitely check that out. Also, uh, Andrew, tell us about what you got, got going on right now. Well, I continue to contribute to the Occidental Observer uh, with yes. Kellen and, uh, and very in other news. <laughs> 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 um, in other news, um, I've taken over an editorial role at the Red Journal, so I'm working alongside Richard Spencer on that, and I'm also editor in chief now of Washington Summit Publishers. Again, working with Richard Spencer and bringing out a number of books this year, including my own Talmud and Taboo essays on the Jewish question. Oh, great. So, That's coming uh, lots of exciting, lots of exciting projects on the go. Excellent. Uh, yeah, definitely. The, we definitely need to talk more about the, the book specifically at some point. But yeah, check that out, folks. Um, if you're listening to this in the archives later on, definitely uh, check out the book. might be out by this uh, point, so check it out. But all right, we have much more to discuss. Let's take a short break, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right back in the second segment. Stay tuned. Stick around, ladies and gentlemen. Second hour with Kevin McDonald and Andrew Joyce is coming up. RedEyesMembers.com is the website where you need to go to listen to the second hour and all of our previous shows. Check out our memberships. That's the best way to support us. You have uh, more information about all of this at RedEyesMembers.com. We'll see you on the other side of the break. Thank you so much for listening. (laughs) 